This is the BBC Light program. We present Mark Bunyan as Tony Hancock, Peter Scott Pressman as Sid James, Barry Skeynes as Bill Kerr, Lucy Spence as Hattie Jakes, and Keith Bersnell as Kenneth Williams in Hancock <laughs> Software. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. Holidays are all very well, but when it comes down to it, there's no place like home. I never could get used to all that strange foreign food. I don't know what you're complaining about. I thought it was delicious. I ate everything that was put in front of me. Including Bill's. If he didn't want it, it seemed such a shame to let it go to waste. You also ate half of mine. I hate to see good food go begging. Remember, a clear plate means a clean conscience. You were leaving it. I was not. I was just merely leaving it settled giving it a moment to slide gracefully through my guts and into my stomach. Isn't that right, Bill? I don't call you hollow legs for nothing, Tubbs. Quite right. If you look after your meat pie, your meat pie will look after you. But I'd just turned round for a quick mouthful of stout to wash it down and whoosh, it was off that plate quicker than Roger Bannister. It's the sea air. All that ozone. Every day I was ravenous. I could have eaten a horse. I know you could. I saw the way you eyed up the milkman's pony. Terrified of your chop as it was. Still, it's good to be back in East Cheam. Cultural capital of West Surrey. Let's face it, over there they don't share our cultural values, our sophisticated Western sensibilities. You must admit the nightlife was marvellous. Something different every night. One can only take so much native entertainment before one begins to tire of the primitive harmonies, the jungle rhythms and simple naive words. Well... I liked White Horse Inn. There's nothing wrong with Wagner Regis. I build a sandcastle every day. Sandcastles? They look like slag heaps. It's not my fault there's all those fag ends on the beach. Well, I was happy to lie on the beach and just soak up the sun. Until the lifeguard came and asked you to get off the beach because the tide was waiting to come in. Soak up the sun? You soaked up all the suntan oil too. You cleared the shelves of boots. I couldn't get hold of Andre Soler for love or money. You need to cover yourself all over. And look what happened. All those boy scouts calling, "'Tis the great white whale, there she blows." Well, I just tanned naturally. I went to deep bronze within hours. That was when you spilt a bottle of stout down your front. It worked, didn't it? The girls were all over me. The flies were all over you. They all wanted to know about my exotic cologne. Oh, yes, Oda Mackison. You may mock, Tubbs, but I went to the palais with a different bird every night. You had to. By the time you'd finished stamping on their corns, they had to be carried home in a taxi. When I danced with Bill, he didn't step on my feet. He couldn't get close enough. He has to be at arm's length with you. Hey, Tubbs, look at the way the post's been piling up. It just shows how popular we are. We've only been away for two weeks, and there's five letters. I wonder if any of them are for me. This one's for you. Your subscription to the Beano is due to be renewed. I miss getting the Beano in Bognor Regis. They did sell it there, you know. I couldn't see it. You should have looked under foreign periodicals. It's not the same as getting it through the letterbox. I like taking off the brown wrapper and steaming off the stamp for my stamp album. Oh, yes. You've got the finest collection of Penny Hapney Greens in theme. Oh, look! Here's the new Littlewoods catalogue. I think I might treat myself to a baby doll nighty. You'd better look in the camping section for a small marquee. Hello, here's the local paper, the Cheam Gazette. I thought we cancelled it while we were away. I wanted to keep it for the book reviews. Since when did they review the naughty books? Now, now, you should be grateful Bill is learning to read. And I like the horoscopes. Horoscopes? What use is a horoscope that's two weeks out of date? You can see whether they were right or wrong. Give it here. This will be a time of surprises. I got that pickled onion stuck in my throat, didn't I? Never expected that. Bang on the button, see? I don't know how they do it. Will you tell him, or shall I? Seems a shame to tamper with such pure natural idiocy, doesn't it? 
Get the paper here. Let's see what's been happening in Cheen. I say, Sylvia Lush has opened a new Woolworths in the High Street. My, my. How did they get her into that frock? Must have smeared her with crab nut oil. Who's Sylvia Lush? You must remember her. She was in Genevieve. She was the one with the big headlights. Well, you would remember that, wouldn't you? Hello, what's this? Cheen Vice Ring. A group of 11 men were sentenced to fines of up to £100 when they appeared in court charged with immoral and indecent offences at a private residence in East Cheen. It's disgusting. What is Cheen coming to? I'm surprised they print this sort of filth in a family newspaper. Continued on page four. Page four. Page, page four. Oh, yes, here it is. What's this? There's a picture of me. Anthony Aloysius Hancock, 37, of 23 railway cuttings, East Cheen, was fined £50 for keeping a disorderly house and a further £50 for indecent conduct. Look, there's even a picture of me. It's a very good likeness. Look, Bill. Oh, yes. They've got your shifty little eyes perfectly. Good good likeness? Are you mad? Do you think I want to be recognised when I go down the high street after this? You're always complaining that people don't recognise you. For services to the arts, yes. For running a knocking shop. Not on your life. There's been some mistake, obviously. When did this happen? Last Monday week. We were away Monday week, weren't we? You can vouch for me, Bill, can't you? Miss Pugh? Miss Pugh? Why are you looking at me like that, Miss Pugh? I always had my doubts about you. Doubts? A girl can tell, you know. It's a matter of hormones, animal attraction. And you've never shown the slightest interest in me. Can't think why. Now you mention it, there is something ephemera, ephemera, something girly about you, Tubbs. Me? Girly? You're right, Bill. You can tell them, you know. It's the wide hips. My hips are as narrow as the next man's. Snake hips Hancock, they used to call me, and then Naffy. You can see they sort of swing, too. Swish, even. My hips do not swish. My hips are a model of propriety. You could take those hips anywhere. Pear-shaped. That's what he is. It's classic, really. It's one of the signs, you know. Have you noticed the way he flaps his arms around? I do not flap... I, I do not flap my arms around. Careful! You nearly knocked over the whatnot. What are we talking about? It's obviously a case of mistaken identity. They've got some bloke who looks like me, and because of my prominent local profile... What's the caption under the photo? Out of work bit part player Hancock. Bit part player? That really is going too far. I'm going down to the Cheen Gazette. I'm going to speak to the editor now. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Hancock, but it's a matter of public record. I mean, bit part player. It's an outrage. You're talking to the star of the amorous prawn, mate. I was the chief whelk. And where did this artistic tour de force take place? Team players at Michael's Church Hall. Not at the West End, is it? I was doing them a favour between engagements. And what exactly was your last professional engagement? I was on Educating Archie. And what were you doing? Oiling his joints. Why am I telling you all this? I came here to get to the bottom of this calumny. I am unjustly accused of a foul slur on my character. How did you get hold of this story? Yeah, as I said, it's a matter of public record. You were convicted of indecency and running a disorderly house at the Chief Magistrate's Court. We had a reporter there. He's very reliable. We're only reporting what happened. Well, why did you have to make it so prominent? Couldn't you sneak it onto page eight? next to the lost and found? No, it was either that or a punch-up on the allotments between rival cabbage growers. I put it to you, Mr Hancock. Which would you rather read? But it's not true. This is a very serious matter. It could ruin me professionally. No, I can see that the loss of earnings could run to pennies. Watch it, Mush. I'm sorry, Mr Hancock. There's nothing I could do to help you. If you want an explanation, you'd better go down the court. <laughs> What did you say your name was? Hancock. 
Antony Aloysius Hancock. I remember the name, very nasty case. You got cheek coming here. Take your hands off my counter, you pervert. I'm not a pervert. You look like a pervert. Your eyes are too close together. Don't you start. You've been convicted. That's all there is to it. I'm appealing. Not to me, you're not. But I was away in Bogner at the time. Bogner Regis? Yes. No, that's different. Everyone knows there are no perverts in Bogner Regis. My mother lives in Bogner Regis. The very idea. So how did this happen? I'll tell you what. Uh, let's have a look at the transcripts of the trial, shall we? Uh, it's here somewhere. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, Regina versus Hancock. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? It's just like crime on our hands. I've never actually read a transcript before. I just log them and file them. I'm pleased that I've brought a little excitement into your dull life, but can we get on with it? It may be a bit of harmless entertainment to you, but it's a matter of life or death to me. Oh, come on, it's not that bad. Everyone expects artists to be a little eccentric. Except it's not true. I'm as heterosexual as Liberace. Shall we start with the police evidence? Yes, let's see what tissue of lies they've concocted. No, I don't like your tone, Mr Hancock. Everyone knows the English Bobby is a model of rectitude. If his word is good enough for the magistrate, it's good enough for the likes of you. The likes of me? I'm a member of the public, mate. I pay your wages. As your employer, I'm entitled to a bit of respect. Do you want to hear it or not? No, oh, go on, then. A PC Roberts. Uh, following a trip off from an informant... What does that mean? What what informant? He was probably reading somebody's diary. A private diary? Is that legal? The cad. With serious crime, you've got to fight fire with fire. Shall I continue? I suppose so. I was proceeding with two other constables along the insalubrious pavement of railway cutting. Insalubrious he knows some big words for a flat foot, doesn't he? A collection of mean, squalid dwellings which have clearly seen better days. Squalid? How dare he? Who does he think he is? The shell guide to East Cheam? A notorious haunt of miscreants and ne'er-do-wells. He's got a nice turn of phrase, hasn't he? I, I approached the front door of number 23, a residence which had clearly come down in the world. I admit it could do with the liquor. Hey, uh, it was opened by a middle-aged man in his shirt sleeve, showing his braces. Oh, that's a bit risque, isn't it? His face was marked with the ravages of vice and lined with the scars of endless nights of debauch. Behind him, I could see several men in stages of undress. Oh. Isn't this exciting? I wish I could have been there. Some people have all the luck. I wanted to be a policeman, but I failed the medical. Not tall enough, I can see. No, my feet weren't flat enough. Shall I continue? Get to the point. Scars of endless nights of debauch. Hmm, yes. What are you looking at me like that for? No, I can see what he means. Scars? I've got skin like a baby's. Baby rhino, maybe. Do you mind? I said uh, this is... PC Roberts. I know that. You don't need to act it all out. You're not Larry Oliver. Spoil sport. Uh, is this 23 railway cuttings? He replied, the number's on the door. Can't you read your dozy pillock? Oh, well, that's not very nice. Should show some respect. I tell you, this is not me. I never use language like that. Poltroon, yes. But... I asked the ringleader, the one who answered the door, what his name was. Hancock, he replied. You see, you can't argue with that. He knows his own name, doesn't he? It's an impersonation. Who'd want to impersonate you? Nobody's heard of you. Now, if it was Frankie Howard or Gracie Fields... I keep telling you it's not me. Well, the court seems to think it was. Here it is. Verdict guilty. Sentence, £50 fine. But I wasn't... I mean, I'm not guilty. So why did you plead guilty? Did I? 
Yes, there it is. Look, bottom of the page. How do you plead? All oh, right, I can read. There's no arguing with that, is there? No, I suppose there isn't. I... So get out of my office, you queer. <laughs> How did it go, Tubbs? Condemned. The mark of Cain upon me. Another martyr in a long line of the outcasts condemned to roam the world in their shackles despised and unloved. Forced to hide their true nature from a cruel and disapproving world. Well, I will at least be in distinguished company. I will share my monstrous martyrdom with Oscar Wilde, Tchaikovsky, Michelangelo, Nobby Trubshaw. Nobby Trubshaw? Friend of my Uncle Bert. We don't talk about him. Well, I'm going to pack. What do you mean, pack? You've only just got back. I can't possibly continue to live under the same roof as a notorious deviant. I have my reputation to consider. How could I invite a gentleman caller home if I shared with the likes of you? It's all right for you, Bill. You're Australian. You haven't got a reputation. But a girl has to consider the future. Gentleman caller? The last time you had a gentleman caller was VE Day, and he was selling encyclopedias. I don't want to be left on the shelf. Don't worry, you'll never find a shelf strong enough. Don't worry, Tubbs. I'll stand by you. I know what you're going through. I can sympathise, thanks to my convict heritage. Getting caught shoplifting in Woolworths hardly qualifies as a convict heritage. Made my ancestors. My great-great-great-great-grandfather was transported for life. It's taken six generations to overcome the shame. And you had to stow away in a cargo of frozen lamb to get back. Oh, that'll be Sydney. I wonder what he wants. You don't get duty freeze coming from Bogner. Oh, he'll just be returning the key I lent him. I'll let him in. You let St. James have unfettered access to our priceless heirlooms for two whole weeks? Quick, Bill, go and count the spoons. I thought we needed someone to keep an eye on the place, in case there was a leak or somebody broke in. He wouldn't need to break in if he had a key now, would he? I'll let him in. Surprise he hasn't just let himself in. Sydney wouldn't do that. Sydney is a gentleman, unlike some I could name. Come on in, Sydney. Evening all. I can see that you've been away, Griselda. You really caught the sun. You look just like Gina Lollabrigida. Oh, oh, Sydney. Just a minute. I'm beginning to get the picture. Turn your face to the light, Sid. The ravages of vice, the scars of endless nights of debauch. Are you talking about Sydney? He's got a lovely face. It's been lived in. Yeah, lived in by a drunken gang of swagmen. Have you been holding parties here, Sid? Parties of uh, an unsavoury nature? Parties? I'd had a few friends around for a game of cards a couple of times. The house was empty and we bought a few beers. We were careful where you put our fag ends. What's the harm in that? And exactly how many friends did you have around for this orgy of card play? Oh, let me see. There was Knuckles McGrew, Muscles McGrew. That's Knuckles' mother. Sweet little old lady. Charlie the Kosh. I met Charlie. Lovely manners. Getaway Gordon. Oh, drives a beautiful Austin princess. How come you know so much? When did you become a gangster's mole? Sydney invited me to high tea with his little friends. Muscles makes a lovely Victoria sponge. Little friends? They're not out of tie time, you know. Tell me, Sydney, would they by any chance be a party of 11 players? Plus you? Including Muscles, yes. And was your party subject of a visit by the local constabulary? Well, yes. They asked us to keep the noise down. Gordon gets a bit excited during a game of beggar my neighbour. And did they find gentlemen in various stages of undress? We were playing strip beggar my neighbour. That was after I cleared them out of the readies. You had the cards marked, as usual. Those were gravy stains. And did you tell them that your name was Anthony Aloysius Hancock? Oh. Well, they, they, they sort of assumed it was my house. There was your rates bill on the dresser, your name was the householder. I never said I was you, but I forgot to deny I wasn't. It must have slipped my mind. Even when I was charged with indecent acts and running a disorderly house? Especially when you were charged with indecent acts and running a disorderly house. 
I couldn't have that on my conscience or on my record. It would ruin my reputation as the hard man of Sutton if they thought I was one of those. And then I remembered. Sir John. You compared me to Johnny? Well, far be it from me to say. John Gingold? I saw him in Coshboy. When he had his bit of trouble last year, what did he go into court as? Hermione. Arthur Gielgud. Lark. If there hadn't been a reporter in court who recognised him, he'd have got away with it too. Then there was Alec Guinness. Not lovely little Alec. He can't be. He's always so good in Ealing. And Acton and Turnham Green, he knew every toilet on the district line. You know what he called himself in court? Herbert Pocket. That's his character in Great Expectations. Well, why couldn't you have done the same? Do I look like a Herbert Pocket? You could have been his South African cousin, Pip. I'll do me a favour. The ID was there to hand. And what about my reputation? You haven't got a reputation, whereas I am a respected member of the alternative economy. Why didn't you explain you were just playing a card game? A card game for 12 people? For money? Not registered as a private club? That's an illegal casino, and that is. The fines can be enormous. You can go to prison. You can go to prison for the other one. I've never approved of gambling for money. No good ever comes of it. But I did win. Really? How much? What I don't understand is how they could suspect a homosexual vice ring in East Cheam in the first place. Oh, that was so unlucky. They picked up Choppers. Choppers? What charming names your friends have. Choppers Maloney, on account of his trouble with his false teeth. I won't ask. They brought him in for going equipped. He had it in his diary. Sunday 28th of August, 6pm, 23 railway cuttings. Cards with the gang. What's so suspicious about that? A harmless game? Except he didn't put cards. All right, beggar my neighbour, then. He didn't put beggar my neighbour either. You know its other name, don't you? No. It said, Sunday 28th of August, 6pm, 23 railway cuttings, strip Jack naked. So, of course, they went through his address book and got the others and looked in their diaries, and they all had strip Jack naked as well, you see? So why did you plead guilty? You've had enough experience getting off charges. You got off stealing Lady Docker's jewellery when they caught you red-handed. You actually had her droppers in your hand when they fingered you. I wasn't responsible for my actions. My psychiatrist said so, and he should know he was round the twist himself. Isn't it marvellous what money can buy? So what went wrong this time? Well, this copper down the station said, if you plead guilty, we'll fix you so you get off at a moment of madness story. Put in a word with the beak and he'll get off with a caution. And I believed him. I must have been mad. So are you going to own up now that it was you and not me? Not on your life. Why on earth should I? Look, kid, remember, there's no such thing as bad publicity. You're always saying not enough people recognise you. Well, they'll recognise you now. I have single-handedly thrust you... You could you be pleased? OK, OK, catapulted you into the public consciousness. You should be grateful. The bookings will start coming rolling in. I'm not touring with soldiers in skirts again. Some people have no gratitude. I don't know what you expect me to do, but you, Sydney, are going down to the police station and turning yourself in on a charge of impersonation. I'd never believe him. He does a dreadful impersonation of you. He'd be booed off stage. No buts. This is my final word. Now get out and never darken my towels again until justice is restored. Don't worry, Sydney. We'll support you. Won't we, Bill? It's not as if he's really homosexual, is it? Exactly. I'll show them that Sydney is all man. Blimey, I don't know which is worse. No more prevarication. Now be off with you. Crown of thorns, that's what I've got. I'll have to change my name. Go underground. Go on the run. It'll be the 39th steps all over again. I know what it is to feel lonely and helpless and to have the whole world against me, and those are things that no men or women ought to feel. I can't be said yet. Not another reporter, please. Mm, good evening. What do you want? I've come for the homosexuals. What homosexuals? I have come to the right house, haven't I? 23 railway cuttings? There are no homosexuals here. Oh, stop messing about. Right here in the paper. Look, 
Cheam Vicering, a group of 11 men... Oh, right, I know, I've read it. Well, where are they? I've come all the way from Purley for the Vicering. I hope you're not going to disappoint me. Do I look like a member of a vice ring? Oh, please. Please say you're a member of a vice ring. I've been looking for a vice ring for ages. There's not much to call for it in Pearly. How could I be in a vice ring when there's only me? Be reasonable. There's me, too. That's not a ring. You need three, at least. What am I saying? For the last time, I am not in a vice ring and I am not a pansy. I am. You have no idea how many times I've hung around parks hoping to come across kindred spirits. Hours I've been at it, summer, winter. No wonder I keep getting colds and it's very lonely. For years, I thought I was the only one in the world who felt like this. I thought I was a freak. I thought I was unique. Oh, that's poetry, you know. Oh, yes, very good. Patient's strong, better look at. But now, thanks to the Cheam Gazette, I know there are others whose hearts beat as mine, who yearn as I do for a tall, handsome man. But I'd settle for you at a pinch. Give us a kiss. Unhand me, sir. You're forgetting yourself. This is Cheam, not Chelsea. Oh, go on. You know you want to. I know no such thing. My thoughts are pure. I think only of Gladys Crumb, darling of the Isolde. I have high hopes that one day her torch will show me down the aisle to the altar. Oh, you trying to kid? And where are the others? There should be eleven of you. Come to that, where's Jack? Jack? Has he stripped naked yet? There is no Jack. There never was a Jack. You're trying to keep him to yourself, aren't you, filthy beast? Not there. I'll never get any fun. Show us your shoes. My what? Your shoes! I bet you're ever so strong. I bet you've got magnificent shoes. I've seen those magazines. Health and efficiency, body beautiful, blonde and butch. They're always throwing beach balls and squatting on columns. I bet you go to the gym every day. Here, let me have a feel. I want to squeeze your bicep. Well, I, I, I must admit, I am a rather fine specimen of manhood. I can see you are. Just one quick feel, right? Strictly on the understanding that I'm not, you know. If you say so. There. Feel that. Oh. Uh, what? Where? It must be there somewhere. Have a feel round for it. Oh, yes, it slipped underneath. Are you in that? Yes. You must be joking. I thought a Brussels sprout slipped down the sleeve of your jersey. Have a look at these, then. I'll just roll my trousers up there. What do you think of them? The most shapely male legs in Clacton holiday camp. Clacton, 1951. And that's official. Who was the judge, Ellen Keller? How dare you? Feel those sinews. Those are cyclists' legs, Mush. You should give them back to the cyclists. You're cheated. Now, stop messing about. I bet these places are hotbed. I bet you have orgies every night. There's nobody else here. Just you and me? Yes. All alone? Yes. Oh, how romantic. We should put on some Mantovani, turn the lights out. Leave that light switch alone. I want you where I can keep my eye on you. And don't you want to be wooed? I could be very wooed. Oh, you are rotten. Here we are. Kindred spirits all alone. I'm not a kindred spirit. Oh, you're only saying that. You're just playing hard to get, you little minx. Your virgin blushes are driving me wild with desire. I'm going to chase you round the sofa. Don't do that. You'll go through the floorboard. Oh, you enchanter. Cut that. I'm ticklish. No, give over. I always wanted a man with a bit of spirit. Come here. Don't pinch. You siren. The only siren round here will be a police siren. You're trying to get me to commit a criminal offence. Safe by the bell. Excuse me. No, don't answer it. Just when we were getting to know each other. Who are you? My name's Jack. Is this where the homosexuals are? I don't believe it. This house is a homosexual honey trap. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. We're the homosexuals. We've got enough for a ring now. I I'm sorry. I didn't introduce myself properly. John Wolfenden. My friends call me Jack. You see, Jack? 
Rather a repulsive specimen, but you've got to start somewhere. You're right, Sidney. We can't just concentrate on the respectable middle-class queers. Are you responsible for this, Sid? You know I'm not like that. I know that, you know that, but he doesn't know it. And you have direct experience of police harassment. That's right, I do. I've been tasked to chair a Home Office committee on homosexuality and prostitution. We are collecting evidence from men who have suffered for their proclivities. Oh, I suffered, mate. My proclivities are always giving me jet. They throb something chronic. I'm referring to your homosexual bent. You'll be a martyr like that Peter Wild Beast. But what about setting the record straight and salvaging my reputation? There's money in it. Really? Police weren't interested in correcting this sordid little business. No lawyer would touch it if you wanted to sue for wrongful arrest. So I thought, who else? And I remembered they're setting up the Wolfenden Committee. It's got to start meeting soon. If they're taking an interest in you, the police won't touch it. But I'm innocent. It's never stopped them before. It's the principle. The principle is your skint. Of course, we'll pay reasonable expenses when you appear before the committee. How much? Leave this to me. Well, you know, Jack, my client's time is extremely valuable and his frail health means he'll have to take taxis, put up in first-class hotels. Yes, I, I rather fancy the Connell. I believe uh, Alec Guinness stays there. You know, the way the police have behaved is a diabolical liberty. Do, do you realise they took away diaries and address books? They took mine? It's as if ABS Corpus never wrote the Magna Carta. I tell you, someone should put a stop to it. When is your committee meeting? You have been listening to Hancock's Half Hour with Mark Bunyan, Peter Scott Bresland, Barry Skanes, Lucy Spence and Keith Bersnell. Incidental music was by Angela Morley. The show was engineered by Neon Studios of Utrecht and produced by Peter Scott Preslin for Homo Promo. It was originally intended for broadcast by the BBC on the 1st of April 1954. Why mistaken identity was never broadcast is not known. Perhaps it was deemed too controversial for the BBC Light programme. As was known at the time, the government were about to set up a committee to look at the issues of homosexuality and prostitution, such was the company we kept in those days, and the Wolfenden Committee was indeed set up in 1954 August. It took three years to produce its report. Hancock's Half Hour was the most popular British radio and TV series between 1954 and 1961, and Tony Hancock was the highest paid comic. At its height, it achieved audience figures of 20 million weekly, and to this day, the radio version is constantly recycled on Radio 4 Extra. Now, to answer the intriguing question, who wrote the script? Where did it come from? I have a theory about this which I can't prove, but who out of all the personnel involved in Hancock's Half Hour would be most likely to have awareness of the contemporary situation for homosexuals? I rule out Kenneth Williams because it is nothing like his style and too revealing. He could never have subsumed his personality to this extent. But there is another candidate, someone who was very shy, but always there in the background, who was with the show from the start and would have known the style intimately. I refer to the composer of the theme tune and incidental music, who also conducted the orchestra, Wally Stott. Stott was a mainstay of the BBC and also provided the music for The Goon Show. But Stott also wrestled with deeply personal issues of gender dysphoria for 20 years. And eventually, in 1972, quietly reappeared in her true identity as Angela Morley. Several people at the BBC refused to work with her after her transition. And as a result of her experience, she left the BBC. Her first job outside the corporation was as orchestrator for the West End show Jesus Christ Superstar. Then she went to the States, and in Hollywood, among the films she worked on were Watership Down, E.T. and Star Wars. It is something of a scandal that the BBC, while happy to make a short, snappy documentary of her life, has never featured her considerable output on Radio 3 in, for example, Composer of the Week. And for the 24-hour celebration of International Women's Day in March, played not one piece of music by Morley, as far as we are aware, among all the women composers. Trans women are OK for prurient curiosity, it seems, but not for celebrating their talent. Or does the BBC hold the view that trans women are not women? 
Perhaps the script was an attempt to bring the issues to a wider public. But listening now and imagining the moral climate of the time, one can see why, in the event, it was never used.